Thank you for joining my talk on the root VM and news and domain species. Uh, my name's Connor Davis, and uh, so there's quite a bit of material. So uh, please uh, hold off questions until the end. There should be should be plenty of time. All right, and it looks like the animations are not going to work. Uh, so some of these slides will be a bit busy. Um, and uh, so just bear with me. We'll start from left, and go right on each slide. But so just a quick outline. Uh, so first I'll introduce myself in a little more detail, as well as the work that we've done uh, behind this presentation. And then uh, I'll go over a couple of prerequisites that uh, will be required for uh, understanding the rest of the talk. And then uh, I'll briefly describe some of the background uh, motivating problems that uh, caused us to pursue this work in the first place. And then uh, we'll go over a brief summary of our proposed solution to those problems. And then in the architecture, we'll dive deep into some of the, uh, the details behind our approach. And then we'll go over some preliminary results that we've seen. And then uh, we'll probably do actually the QA after that. And then if there's time, there'll be a demo at the end. The demo is pre-recorded and the link is attached. So uh, you can watch that after <clears throat> if we do run out of time. Okay, Next slide. So, uh, like I said, my name is Connor Davis. I'm a software engineer, a researcher at Assured Information Security in the CompArc Group. We do a lot of work at the uh, boundary of hardware and software, and uh, a lot of the interesting interactions there, including hypervisor work. Uh, I'm a contributor to the Bearflank Hypervisor SDK, which we'll be talking about in the next slides. I'm also helping out with the Zen port uh, to RISC-5 currently. And this talk is uh, about an exploration of the scheduler and interrupt virtualization design space uh, as it applies to Zen. And from this work, there sort of emerged this new idea, this new concept called the root domain, which I'll be going over. And uh, just as a, as a note, this is specific to Intel x86 uh, devices, uh, specifically client devices. Uh, and it's also focused on TDH domains, HVM domains, so domains that are running in uh, a full VM. So uh, real quick, one assumption, uh, VMN is going to appear a lot in the, in the next uh, few slides. So when I say VMN, I mean the code that's actually running in the NX root, uh, so the hypervisor. And then, uh, so now we'll go over a couple of, of definitions and technologies that are needed. So first, uh, what is a root domain? So a root domain is a Zen domain. It's the first domain that is launched by a hypervisor. There's one vCPU per tCPU that's penned. And it owns a configurable subset of PCI devices. It runs in PDH, so it's running in VMX non root. Uh, it is a DOM U from the perspective of the PD interface. And it owns uh, all but uh, one of the timers on the system. And we'll be talking more about that in a couple slides. So then uh, the next piece we need to know is uh, Bearflank. So Bearflank is an open source ecosystem for virtualization research. Uh, it is uh, designed to be useful for quickly developing uh, proof of concepts and uh, trying out new architectures and just exploring the design space as, as we've done for this work. Um, and for, for this work in particular, we used Micro-V, which uh, Prior to this work, it, it supports booting into uh, Linux and Windows from UEFI. Uh, it also supports PCI pass-through, and it supports running small Linux guest virtual machines. OK, so some of the motivation behind, uh, behind this work. So to start at the, the few customers we have in our Zen deployments, they, um, there are some, some complaints and issues here. The first is peripheral support or lack thereof. 
Uh, and then the next uh, has to do with power management. So um, remember, this is focused on client devices. So uh, battery life is really important. Uh, so things like suspend resume are important as well. And we found that uh, there's quite a bit of issues with these things. And so the solution that, that we that we had, uh, that we proposed, is that we would like to reuse as much code as possible in uh, or from the operating system that was designed for the device, right? So if you have, say, a Surface Pro, then ideally you would be able to run uh, Windows at, like for the most part, and, and be able to reuse as much of the power management and drivers and uh, scheduling code because it's going to be optimized uh, for that device. That's the uh, that's the main idea, the thing that we wanted to uh, test and evaluate. So the way that we did that is, uh, the way the path that we decided is we wanted to leverage Micro-V itself uh, because it already supported booting into Windows uh, as uh, with Windows running as a VM. Uh, it already supported PCI pass-through, as I mentioned. And, and so then based on that, we implemented a subset of this NPV interface uh, specifically for creating small Linux VMs uh, and then supporting basic uh, TV devices. Uh, so version one of, of grants and um, FIFO events. And then we took that uh, that subset, that interface, and, and integrated PBH domains on top of that, running in the context of a root domain. Um, and so the the main the main goals that we wanted, like I said before, we wanted good battery life. So performance per watt was very important. We wanted a low overhead architecture, specifically around interrupts. And um, but then we also wanted to support you know, standard uh, or expected security features such as driver domains, you can have isolation, device isolation, things like this. And then uh, we also wanted to see uh, see how PB devices would work in the context of a root domain, uh, both front side, so we, we, uh, we modified the upstream Zen bus and uh, Zen PB drivers to support that. Then we also, uh, to support front end devices, and then we also wanted to um, make sure we had a back end device running in the root domain as well. So you can kind of see every angle and how it worked out. So um, this talk is mainly about uh, numbers two and three. And number four really weren't its own um, its own talk. So yeah, for now we'll focus on uh, specifically domain creation and then the scheduling and interrupt architecture uh, in the context of a root domain. All right, so like I said, the slides are a bit busy. There were animations, but uh, it's not letting me use that. So we'll start from left and work right. So um, really for domain creation, there's three domains that we care about. Right? So the first one is the root domain. Um, and so we started the hypervisor down at the bottom left and we, we uh, so we're booted from, from EFI, this is from EFI. And so the hypervisor will uh, do PCI bus enumeration. It will um, perform uh, any configuration for sort of pass through, which I'll go into later. And then it goes into uh, standard Zen structures like the console and store page. And then it builds up an EPT. Uh, and then from there, once we transition to that yellow box, everything is running as a, as a guest. So it's running in BMX non root. And then from there, the standard boot flow uh, occurs. Uh, and then, so then, we have the root domain, it's running, then we want to create more domains. And so the domains in, in blue, uh, those are what I call guest domains. So let's say, let's just create a, a guest domain here. So what you need for that is a process. So this UBCTL is a process that's running in the root domain. And so the first thing it does is it does an IOCTL, an IOCTL create VM into the builder driver and it's the driver that we wrote and basically the builder driver just allocates memory for the domain uh, from the root from the root OS and initializes some state like ACPI and then it sends that information down into the hypervisor uh, and then the hypervisor will 
but the main thing that it does from there is it unmaps the RAM from the root domain so that the root domain no longer has access to the guest memory. And so then at that point, this, this blue DOM0 um, is, it has been created. And it's DOM0 from the, from the perspective of the PD interface. So these flags, um, some of the flags that are set are the privileged, the privileged and SIF and it, and it domain. So once it's created um, and we want to run it, then we bind the vCPU to a thread in the, from this process. And I'm gonna be talking about that more in the next slide. Uh, but just suffice it to say, for now it's bound to a thread and that's that's how it's run. So then let's say we wanna create another domain, a DOM U. And so from there, um, the first thing that needs to happen is, um, so actually this Zen store rendezvous, that's actually optional, uh, if, but it's needed if you want TV devices in the root domain itself. And so um, the reason there's, there's, a, there's kind of a chicken and egg problem here is that you have a root domain, which remember is a DOM U that's started already by the time DOM zero is created. And so there has to be a handshake and some cooperation there um, basically introducing the Zen store nodes so that the PV devices can work uh, after that. Okay, so then, and like I said, that's just optional for, for PV in the root domain. So then um, for creating a DOM U in this context, it's really just a standard Excel create. Uh, there's, there's really no change to the, um, to, to the code. It's just uh, all the code is uh, able to be reused. And then the same process is used for DOM you, you when you when you want to run it. So um, the vCPU is bound to a thread in UVCTL, uh, and then uh, so that that's the the basics of basically three types of domains that could be created in this uh, in this architecture. So now I'll talk more about the interrupt and uh, scheduling mechanism in a bit more detail. So. Uh, starting with the, on the left again, with the root domain. Um, so in this architecture, there is no timer emulation at all. There is uh, each APIC, so the local APIC and the IO APICs are passed through. And uh, critically, there is no external interrupt exiting in the root domain. So all of the interrupts are delivered through the IDT, normally without causing an exit. Uh, and then, um, so that's that's the basics of, the root domain interrupts. So for guest domains though, we do need timer and APIC emulation because obviously you can only have one thing driving those things at a time. Um, and so then when we actually go to schedule a guest domain, and remember the guest domain is in blue. So when we need to schedule that, the way it happens is UVCTL, this process, it does a VM call down into the hypervisor and the hypervisor then uh, does a VM resume into the vCPU and the guest domain. Uh, and then, so you have that running. And, and then, so basically that runs until another event happens and the set of events that can occur or that, that cause a switch in this case would be an external interrupt. So for guest domains, you do need external interrupt exiting turned on. Uh, but you could also have a halt instruction, say, from, from the guest kernel, uh, and you can also have the VMX preemption timer. So that's the one timer that the VMM uses, uh, and that's just to ensure that the domain doesn't overrun its, its uh, allotted amount of time. And then, uh, so then from there, the hypervisor, based on these reasons, will switch back into the root vCPU that UVCTL is running in. And you know if it's an interrupt, the the interrupt can be handled uh, by the root OS and so on. Okay. So then the other interesting piece of this interrupt architecture is um, so, so the goal was to avoid as much overhead as possible and uh, ideally avoid external interrupt exiting as much as possible because it adds a lot of overhead. And uh, but we still need a way to send IPs to other cores. And so the way that we did this is with the NIT signals. You can program the local APIC uh, with a NIT delivery mode. And the init signals are actually treated uh, specially 
and they have their own exit reason that's separate from the external interrupt exit reason. And so it allows you to kind of sidestep that problem. Um, and so the way basically the way it works, there's two scenarios. So, so the first you have the, the sender of the IPI uh, will set a code so in some variable that basically instructs what the other core is to do. And then uh, it, right, it programs the uh, local APIC with a net delivery mode. And then there's, so there's two scenarios. The one in the middle is when the init signal arrives at the CPU, when the CPU is running in BMX non root, in which case there is an init BMX. It. And from there, in that init BMX it handler, the VMM checks the IPI code and sees, oh, there's something I need to do, like a QA shoot down or something. Um, and, and that's basically it. And then the other case is when the init signal arrives in BMX root mode, so the hypervisor is running, in which case the processor will hold uh, the signal pending until the next uh, VM entry, and then there will immediately be another VM exit, uh, and then the, the hand plane is the same. So the hypervisor checks the code and does what it needs to do. So this is pretty neat. It, it allowed us to still have IPIs and do things that require the TLB shootdowns um, and avoid turning on external interrupt which was the main goal here. Okay. Uh, so then the next uh, next piece is event channels. So this is actually pretty straightforward. Um, so you can kind of divide it into two cases. The first is having a guest receiver. And um, so this is, you know, that's pretty standard. The, the root domain does the event channel send hypercall, the hypervisor then uh, takes that and uh, does a VMX, uh, VTX injection through the VMCS into the guest uh, in blue. So that's that's pretty normal. Uh, the the other case is when the, the root is receiving the the interrupt, and so it starts off the same. You have the guest uh, domain in blue. It's doing a, a send hypercall. The hypervisor then it actually has to use the actual hardware to deliver the interrupt. You can't use the VMCS because remember the root domain is uh, driving the local APIC. It owns the local APIC. And so if it sees an interrupt, it's going to send an EOI. And the hypervisor um, isn't trapping on the EOI, right? And so it really needs to originate from the hardware. So the way that that works is basically the hypervisor just takes the event the the uh, up call vector for each CPU and programs it into the the ICR as an IPI and the IPI gets delivered and that way when the root domain does the UI it actually acts the actual interrupt in hardware. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so then um, the next uh, piece is PCI pass through. So again, we're working left to right. Uh, so we start with. Uh, we're just doing a scenario where we want to pass through a NIC, uh, the NIC set bus size function 0, uh, 1, 0, 0. So we input that as some configuration, command line or something, into the VMM. The VMM then uh, probes the DMAR and unmasks the DMAR so that the, the root domain uh, doesn't, doesn't use it, doesn't try to use it itself. And then it unmaps the, um, the NICs regions bar uh, port IO and MMIO regions from the root domain so that the root domain doesn't have access to it. And then the hypervisor creates what's called a visor device. It's just a uh, uh, emulated PCI device that um, is close to what you're passing through, but the vendor device IDs are changed so that it binds to the visor driver that's running in the root domain instead of the actual driver. Um, and the reason you need that is you need a you need to expose MSI uh, the MSI capability so that you can get a vector from the root domain <clears throat> uh, because eventually the interrupts are going to be firing and you need to be able to handle those because remember they don't trap to the hypervisor they're going to be delivered directly so you need to you need to reserve a vector for that so then um, so then now I'm going to go over here in the screen box the standard pass through flow. So this is, uh, like it says, is pretty normal. Uh, you've had created a DOM U and we're passing it through to a DOM U, which I said that earlier, but uh, so we're passing this NIC to a DOM U. So 
you exo create the, the domain, you assign the device like normal, you, you do PCI back hide. And, and then for the main thing in the, in the DOM view, when it starts up, the hypervisor has to trap on the MSI register access so that it can get the vector that the guest expects to see. So in this case, we'll just call it vector U. Um, and so once you have that, you're ready to receive interrupts from the device. And so there's two scenarios. The first one is when an interrupt arrives in the root domain context. And in that case, it's going to be the operating system is going to see that, hey, this vector R belongs to visor. So then it's going to call the visor IRQ handler. And then that, all it does is VM calls down to the hypervisor. And uh, the hypervisor then translates uh, the vector basically is a mapping from R to U and it does a VM, uh, injection, uh, of that event. So then the other, uh, the other case is when the interrupt arrives while a guest domain is running. And in that case, remember there's external interrupt action is turned on for guest domain. So then that just does an exit and, uh, same translation process happens from, from R to U. And uh, and then the the U is injected into the domain. And so one thing that's kind of interesting with this is it's uh, it supports devices that are that are owned by the IOM and you or excuse me by the VMM itself, like the IOM and you. So if you wanted to use the IOM and you, you wanted to use queued invalidation, for example, then you need to enable. You have to have an interrupt that's owned by the hypervisor, then you should be able to install. Well, a fake PCI device here with an expose an MSI, and it would be completely emulated, but you could extract a vector from the operating system in that case and use it as a placeholder. And then the same, um, the same sort of flow would be, would, would work the same way, except you wouldn't be injecting into the, um, into the domain. You would be handling it yourself in the hypervisor. Okay. So, uh, so we have some initial results of this. Um, we need to do more. Uh, this is the devices that I've tested on, I haven't been able to get um, zero PVH to work yet. Um, and that is closest in spirit to what a root domain is, since the root domain is running as as a um, in a VM with EPT, things like that. So still need to do that. Um, and still need to do some more granular tests, like uh, just isolating the effect of external interrupt exiting and non-external interrupt exiting. Um, but so I'll, I'll go over what we do have. Um, so from the Windows root domain, we've done PC mark and we've, we've had pretty good success with that. There's, uh, it showed only 2% battery life degradation relative to, to just a native Windows. And this is just with a VM running kind of like a wild one in the background. Um, and then for Linux root domain, uh, we've, we've tested client centric workloads with Veronix test suite. And, um, I listed here sort of the, the parameters of the test with Linux kernel version, the Zen version, as well as the micro version. And, um, <clears throat> so I'll just talk about some of those briefly. Uh, so this is the first one, the wire guard test. This one is, uh, well, so first I'll go over what these bars mean. So native is just Linux. Just plain Linux, no virtualization at all. And then the root DOM is Linux running as a root domain on top of micro V. And then DOM zero PV is just a plain, uh, PV DOM zero setup. Now this is command line parameters here. Um, so, uh, like I said, I still need to do PDH and, and also need to do things like pass through and with uh, multiple guests running. These are just for the root domain itself. No other domains are running. Um, but you can see it's uh, the root domain does pretty well. It, um, it performs pretty close to the native, which was the goal. Um, and so this this test in particular is heavy on CPU. Uh, there's a lot of encryption and decryption happening um, because you have, uh, it, it sets up basically three network device uh, namespaces. Um, and there's basically a, a wire guard tunnel going over a loopback device. So there's a lot of encryption and decryption happening and scheduling happening. Uh, so this is the result on this one. It's kind of interesting. 
And then, uh, so the next one we did is Dbench. It's a common one for disk IO. And um, so some of these tests have uh, per watt measurements is that's ideal for, for measuring the, the effect of on client devices. And so you can see it's uh, root, domain, root domain does pretty well. It's pretty close to native, which was what we wanted to, to see. Uh, and then similar for Selenium. Selenium is uh, WebAssembly and JavaScript benchmarking. So uh, it's part of a browser benchmarking tweet. And so uh, you can see, uh, again, the, the root domain does pretty well. It stays within uh, pretty close to, to, <clears throat> to native speeds. Okay, so these are some some links. Uh, all this code is, is open source, so you can play with it if you'd like. Uh, and these last two, I didn't get to talk about this because this was, if you remember on the approach slide number four, we modified the PV drivers. And um, so the, the, the block back implementation that's running in user space, that's these two links uh, implement that. Um, let's see. Okay, yeah, so I don't, you don't have time for the demo. You, it, it is linked there. Uh, so if you want to watch it, you can. Um, but uh, other than that, that is, uh, that is it. So I'll take some questions. What hardware was that running on? Was it NUMA? So this was a, uh, the, the benchmarking, it was a Dell Latitude 3400. It was a core, it was a laptop, uh, core i5, core i7, 8th gen. Uh, is this an evolution of the talk from last year from Verifying Desert about launching Zen from a DOM zero kernel module and then hoisting? Yeah, so this one, it, it, this was, uh, so you're referring to the sort of the late launch, and uh, this one was focused on the sort of booting from EFI. Um, but yes, yeah, same, uh, same idea. Uh, yeah, who's doing the scheduling? Yeah, so the scheduler in the root domain is the, the thing that's scheduling in that case. Yeah, so I, Basically, the point is this is just to raise um, raise awareness, and and um, if it's if it's something that's uh, you know uh, that the Zen community seems worthwhile, then um, maybe we can talk about upstreaming some of this into into to Zen. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's another question. Um, I think we're I think we're good to go. So thank you all for. Yeah, so the the for the upstream in the time donation hypercall, that's um something definitely something that could be could be uh upstreamed. So I just need to talk about it, you know, over mailing list or something, exactly what what pieces would be needed and, and things like that. Yeah. All right, thank you all.